turn one last time for this week to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'll finish my series on David and Goliath. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I, I love this story. I loved it as a child, and I've loved it as we've gone through it. Just like Psalm 23, I'm amazed at the things that we've learned from this, this lesson. And uh, I uh, am overwhelmed with the thought this morning. We are uh, we're going to the battle. Amen. We've been in preparation for four Sundays. Now we're ready to go to battle. Amen. And I hope you're ready. Uh, let's read together. You follow along silently while I read aloud verses 48 through 58, 1 Samuel 17. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Woo! I got to say, glory to God, hallelujah. Man, I like that, don't you? Woo, man. Don't you love a victory? Amen. I like it when good overcomes evil. When, uh, when, uh, when the evil is finally revenged and, and put in its place. I just love that. And I see that old giant fall dust billowing up around. Mm. And David with a big old smile on his face because he's seen God do something that only God can do. All right, let me go on. I'll, I'll get to preaching in a minute. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheave thereof and slew him, cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled and the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley of the gates of Ekron. And, he wound, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharam, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And, the, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Father, I pray that in the next few moments, you'll allow us just for a moment, Lord, to step into the, the, uh, the skin of David. Might we desire more than anything else to be a David. Might we desire, Father, to see the victory that only you can bring, to have the trust and faith that you will do exactly what you said you'll do and be able to stand not, Father, as defeated, but, Lord, as victors, more than conquerors, because of what you've done for us. We love you and thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's not forget the lessons that we've already learned. If I may, let, let me just rehearse for a second. Lesson number one, we found that uh, uh, like the Philistine army should have already been defeated. And our, our lesson was if we would take care of complete obedience, we could avoid encounters with the same old problems, amen? Some of us just stay in the battle, just in a rut, fighting the same battle over and over and over again because we never follow God's complete obedience to get rid of it in our lives. Lesson number two is to never let the enemy convince you that they're bigger than you and your God. I'm afraid this morning as I call you to uh, go to battle, many of you have been hiding in your tents for a long time. You've gotten accustomed to hiding your tent because you think that giant is bigger than you and your God. He is not. He is merely a mouthpiece is all he is. He's just a blowhard. But he can convince you of so many things. But you've got to, you've got to overcome that. You've got to see this giant for what he is and what God wants to show through you being obedient to him. Lesson number three, always encourage those who take the lead. Never be a fire extinguisher. Amen? Churches are full of fire extinguishers. I mean, somebody gets on fire for the Lord, well, he'll calm down a little bit, you know. Just calm down, calm down, calm down. Come on, let's just encourage people that get on fire for the Lord. In fact, why don't we just join them? Amen? Lesson number four, always fight the battles God wants you to fight with the armor God's given you. Never be discouraged by others' lack of involvement. Those were the two lessons I got out of that one. And uh, how important that is. You know, there's people that... Uh, and I'm not uh, just... You ask, for, you ask for volunteers. 
One person will raise their hand. You know, a lot of people are looking around and saying, is anybody else going to do it? Right? Because and it, and when, we, when we literally, when we step up, God encourages others to get involved. That's a good thing. Don't ever be the last one. Always be the first one. Amen. That's the way I look at it. Now we come to the last lesson. And this lesson is going to be a simple lesson about trusting God to bring victory. We'll encourage others to get involved. Now, now we approach the scene of this for this one last time. We're ready to see the outcome of all that's taken place. The army of God is cowardly, hiding up in their tents, trembling at the voice of this blowhard giant Goliath, this nine foot six, 600 pound man with about 300 pounds of armor on him, spewing threats and spouting about being the champion of the Philistine army. And we put, we put that to sleep, haven't we? And suddenly, there the Philistine army behind him, you can probably hear them cheer him on with jeers. Yes, that's right. The enemy always likes to gang up on you, you know? We probably can hear the comrades chanting and cheering on. Suddenly, there appears coming down the hill out of the camp of Israel, this little man. He has no armor on. And he comes running out of the camp of Israel. Now, the Philistine army, I just imagine at that point, probably gets quiet for a second to see what's about to happen. And all of a sudden they realize this is the champion that Israel has sent. And can't you imagine there was some laughter? Oh, I imagine. Can you? Here's little old David running up to this big old giant Goliath, the Philistine army. I'm sure they had a good joke with that one, a good laugh with that one. But he comes running. Let's pick up. Verse 48, it's time to confront the giant. David's done everything. He's, he's talked to his brothers and they've tried to convince him not to go. He's, he said, where is everybody? Where is there not a cause? He's con- tried to keep people involved. He's tried to get people stirred up. He's just a young man. He's probably 16, 17 years old. Uh, he still, still hadn't started shaving yet. You know that kind of guy. Uh, ruddy face, maybe a little pimple face. And he's, here he comes. He said, why are we out there fighting? You know, good night. You know, these big old army guys, they trained soldiers and they're standing around this young boy and he's kind of putting them down and he's done all that he's met with Saul and Saul's tried to put his armor on him and that didn't work and finally David says you know what let's get on with this thing it's time to fight let me at him and oh David I mean I think he took out of that camp if if it were a cartoon wouldn't you see him with dust coming out from underneath his heels as he's running I mean, he's not afraid. He's not a bit of fear in him whatsoever. He's excited and anxious at the opportunity to see God do something. And he knows he will. And we see him just run at this giant. David's complete trust in God made him anxious to see God do what only God can do. You know what? Whenever we have experienced God's ability... In tough situations, it makes us anxious or should make us anxious for the next one. I don't like those tough situations, do you? I I don't like them. And there's many times after I've gone through them, I say, Lord, I don't want to go through that again. But thank you for what you taught me as I went through it. But I love the fact that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I just got a picture. Oh, David, I I don't think he ever stopped running. I, I have it in my mind. Oh, David was running, and I think as he's running, he's reaching in that bag, and he's getting that stone out, and he's looking at that old giant, and he's stretching that sling out, and all of a sudden as he's running, almost like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a cowboy with a rope, he takes that sling, and all of a sudden he's just running, and that sling's going around and around, and old Philistine looking, old giant looking at him like, what in the world's happening here? And all of a sudden he slings that rock, and it rock dead right in the middle of that giant's forehead. And he don't see anything but stars as he plummets to the ground. Maybe even backward. No, it said he fell on his face. But he just fell. Kafood! 
You know, it reminds me of Caleb. I, there's great men in the Bible that had this attitude. Caleb was like that. 85 years old. Anybody here 85? 86, 87, 88? 87? 85 years old. He'd already fought all the battles. For 40 years, they've been fighting and waiting, and now they're in the promised land, and what are they going to do now? And he's fighting and fighting and fighting. And for five years, they fought in the land of the, the claiming the, the victories one after another. He's one of the generals in the army. And he's fought all these battles. And it finally comes time for him to receive his inheritance. And Joshua says, Caleb, where do you want to retire? Where do you want to go and enjoy your retirement? You've earned it. And old Caleb says, uh, is that mountain where all those giants were, Goliath, where he came from, is, is any of their, their stock still remaining up there? And he said, well, yeah, I want that mountain. Oh, that Caleb, you got to love old Caleb. He wasn't afraid. He wanted to see God do more. He'd seen him do so much. You know, the problem with many of us, we've never seen God do anything. Boy, I tell you what, when you get to see God do something, major in your life that you realize there was no way anything else could have happened except God stepped in. It makes you want to see it again. Caleb understood that. Paul. Remember Paul had been praying to the Lord. He had a thorn in the flesh. Three times he prayed for God to remove it. And finally in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul then says this, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you hear what he's saying? If this is, if this is what I've got to suffer, I will glory in it because I know you are allowing it and you're going to use it. You've got some plan. I'm okay with it. I will glory in my infirmities. Because whenever that happens, I feel the power of Christ rest upon me. He goes on and says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities, in persecutions and distresses. I wonder, can you say that? I take pleasure in all the bad things that happen to me in life. I take pleasure in the fact that the doctor told me I've got cancer. I take pleasure in the fact that my son called and said that he's having some problems I don't know what to do with. I don't take pleasure in the fact of the money problems I'm having. I'm going to take pleasure in these things. Why? For Christ's sake, he says. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. David hasted and ran towards the enemy. Now let me say this. Out of all the men of this army that could have experienced what David is about to experience, none of them choose to believe God. Now hear me, this is important. Boy, when I saw this, I just thought, man, I need to, we need to camp on this one for a minute. Many of us miss out on seeing God do what only he can do because we have started listening to the giant. We won't get in the battle. We sit on the outside. We sit on the fringes. Like Brother Jeff was praying for this morning. <laughs> go ahead, Jim. You go fight. Go ahead, David. You go fight. We'll stand here and cheer you on. Go, David. But don't expect us to get in the battle. I'm telling you, I think a majority of us Christians fail to see some of the most wonderful miracles of God simply because we're afraid to get in the battle. Yeah, I thought it might be a little quiet. But you see, God was ready to defeat that giant. God had full intention on knocking that giant down to his level. There was nothing going to stand in God's way. He was just waiting for one man to step up. And David was going to be that man. Not King Saul, although he was head and shoulders above them all. Oh, no, not King Saul. That was beneath him, I guess, or I'm not sure. I think he was just scared. It's not David's brothers, although they had the opportunity. They'd been there for this battle all this time. They could have stepped up, but they didn't. It could have been any one of these thousands of men that were gathered there as part of the army of God, but it wasn't. It took little David, a shepherd boy, to come in there and say, I'll trust God. And God said, that's all I need. 
I don't need anybody big. I don't need anybody that's been prepared for battle. All I need is somebody committed to do what I tell them to do. That's all I need. And David is going to be the one we talk about today, not Saul, not his brothers. I doubt many of us could even name his brothers. Isn't that a shame? They could have been the David, but they weren't. And you could be a David, but many times you're not. I don't know if you know Dr. or have ever heard of Dr. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist, one of the greatest evangelists of all time. He was challenged by a statement from one of his friends one time. His friend said, it is yet to be seen what God could do with one man who was totally surrendered to him. When the man made that statement, Mr. Moody set out to be that man. He was committed to be totally surrendered to God. It's reported that the great D.L. Moody won over a million people personally to the Lord. That's amazing. And that's not even counting all the hundreds, thousands that were saved in the Crusades. He's the founder of the great Moody Bible Institute up in the Chicago area. He was one of the greatest evangelists the world's ever known. You know why? Because he was totally surrendered to Christ. We admire Paul. We admire great men of history that that made a statement that left a mark in history for Christ. But listen, you could be that person. There's nothing keeping you from it except your willingness to completely surrender to Christ. Anyone can be a David. Anyone. God can use anyone. However, he will only use the one that is surrendered to his will. I, uh, my greatest giant is a person called self. He eats me alive. Self. I, uh, I'm honest with you. I want my will, not his. And whenever I want my will, not his, I'm not usable. I'm not usable. I know when I'm wrapped in self. I know when I preach a message when self has taken control. Because at the end of it, I feel defeated. You may have gotten blessed because God will use it anyway, but I know in my heart that it wasn't right. I wasn't surrendered. I wasn't listening to the Father. I was getting out what I wanted to get out. Now that's me confessing to you about my giant. This morning, I had to go before the Lord and say, Lord, not this morning. Not my will, but yours. That's all he needs. That's all God needs. For you to see the victories that God has in your life. If only you just surrender to his will. How many times we've missed out on being the vessel of honor simply because we were unprepared. You know, to be a vessel of honor, you've got to be moldable in the hands of the potter. The potter takes that clay and he begins to mold you into what he designed you to be. Not what you want to be, what he wants you to be. That's the potter's will. It's you are potter's design. You keep trying to make it about you. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about what he wants you to be. And as he's beginning to mold this vessel, all of a sudden he'll find a hard spot. And you'll have to take that hard spot and remove it and then take that clay and crump it together and start again. Some of us, we just keep getting smaller and smaller vessels because he keeps finding these old clumps of self that have to be removed in order to experience God's victories in our lives. We have to see the big picture that swallows up our desires, swallows up our wants to become part of God's purpose and his alone not ours. I love life. I love spending time with my family. I loved this last week. I enjoyed so much being with my kids. But if God's not in the center even that, it's a missed opportunity. God has such a bigger picture. You, you never know what God's doing. 
You never know. I've invited uh, Pat Camerata to come back and preach for us again. Many of you won't know that name, but some might. Pat Camerata preached for us back probably right after about 2003 or four. We had a revival. He came and he preached. He's a friend of mine. Did a great job. I think it was Tuesday night. Halston Hill visited our church. He visited a couple of times. He was sitting right about where Patty is. In fact, I think it's the aisle behind where Patty's sitting. He was sitting right there on the edge. When the invitation came, he came forward. He wanted to get saved. I talked to Pat this week. I said, Pat, I want to tell you a story that you don't know about. He said, what's that? I said, you preached and Halston got saved, but you don't know the rest of the story. That sermon that night changed his life and changed the life of our church and another church as well. What happened? And I told him how Halston had sought out Brother Massey to befriend him because, he was a, because Brother, uh, Brother Halston was a bigot all his life. And he wanted a friend. He wanted a black friend. Sought him out. Made him his closest friend. They vacationed together. They fished together. You find one, you found the other. And he brought Brother Massey down here, introduced me to him, and it changed our lives of our churches. It did. You don't know from just one statement, one encounter, how many lives can be touched. You've got to realize what God's called you to do is important. It belongs in a big picture. It's not just about you. So many of us, we just get wrapped up in self. It's all about me. It's what I get. It's what I get to do. It's where I get to go. It's what I have. It's, it's all about me. No, it's not. It's all about God. Everything you do God's going to use in some way. David's approach to this giant. Was he concerned about his wants or desires? No. You know what David wanted? David wanted to uphold the honor of his Lord. He wanted to be available to God's service. To use what God had given him, whatever it was, no matter how big or little it was, he would be a champion for God with nothing more than a sling and a stone. Verse 51 through 53 tells us his fearlessness encouraged the others to get involved. Notice this. David slays Goliath. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. The armies, I think, were expecting a real fight now. You know, I, Israelite army probably didn't expect much. I mean, they're sending the littlest kid they've got, and he doesn't even have any armor on. They don't think this is going to last long. The other army was expecting a warrior to come out, a champion from the Israelite army. They expected probably we're going to have a good fight, a, a good gladiator battle, you know, where each team would cheer for the other one. Little did they know this was going to be a, uh, about a 15-second fight, Amen. Didn't take long for that stone to reach its target. To put an end to this battle, David uses Goliath's own sword to cut off his head. Can you imagine the open mouths of the Philistine army as they watch this? Before he came down and they're laughing. Are you kidding? <laughs> that little squirt, I could take him. And then all of a sudden they see their giant fall. David standing on top of this giant, his sword drawn and cutting his head off. The Philistine army, I, don't, I, bet, it, I bet it was whisper quiet. I think their mouths were, flies were flying in their mouths. I mean, I think it was that bad. Defeating the enemy of God's power, uh, defeating the enemy in God's power is not hard. It just takes willingness to trust God and then move in that confidence. I love the fact that David used Goliath's own sword to end this battle. The stone may have killed him, we don't know, but we know this. When he cut his head off, he was dead. And David takes, David didn't even have a sword, a dagger, or nothing to cut his head, nothing. He has to use Goliath's own sword. Now he didn't, and Goliath, this big, I'm thinking this sword's probably about this tall. Probably weighs about 50, 60 pounds. No, David takes that thing and he's 
whittling on that head, maybe chopping on it, I don't know. And I mean, sometimes the very thing that causes us to be fearful is the very thing we have to use to defeat that giant. Sometimes you just have to step off into it and trust God. Well, notice what happens. Verse 51 goes on to say, when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they ran. I told you this army was a bunch of cowards. They're a bunch of losers. They're not going to stay and fight. Poor old Goliath, I mean, you know, he didn't have any back, anybody to back him up. These guys, they were cowards. They run, and they didn't want anything to do with this. Well, you think about it. Here they are. They're standing and seeing a nine-foot giant defeated by about a five-foot and six-inch boy, and they go, my goodness, if that army's full of those, we better get out of here. Amen? Do you realize what happens to the, to the enemy when they see a warrior of God that stands in the power of God, they run. Do you know even their leader runs? The devil himself will run. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, whenever we are willing to let God be in control in fighting the enemy instead of us always trying to do it, we resist that old devil. We turn our backs on what he's saying. We don't have time for that garbage. He says he'll flee from us. He'll run from us. Revelation 12, 11, we've been studying. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. There's the, there's the uh, criteria for success as a warrior of God. The blood of the lamb, the word of the testimony, and not afraid to die. You will always be a victor. Verse 52, now what happens? The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley, the gates of Ekron. David's victory over this giant empowered the army. You know, the ones that were sitting up in the tent, you go, no, you go, no, you go. Hey, look, they're running. Let's all go. I mean, that's kind of what happened. They jumped in. They're ready to get involved. Why? Because they were empowered by the courage and the stamina and the stick to itiveness of David. David said, I've come to fight and I will fight. And when he did and he showed that God was going to be on their side, they jumped in. Your involvement in the work of God not only gets the job done, it encourages others to get involved. That's why it's so important for you to not be afraid to get involved. Just jump in. But I don't know if anybody helped me. Jump in. Your involvement will bring somebody else along beside you. And let me just say this too. It works the other way around too. Your lack of involvement will also create a lack of involvement by others. Oh, I'm not going to. Nobody else is going to. I don't see anybody else stepping up to do it. Why should I? Well, although David defeats the giant, all of them are going to receive the blessing of victory. Look at verse 53. It says, And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. David had actually won the victory. But here they come back, and they get to, they get to reap the blessing of the victory. Now, some will say, Well, that doesn't seem fair. You see, when you say that, you're saying, I'm not a part of a team. It's all about me. You see, we're all a part of a team. We're, we're, we're gathered together. We're part of the army of God. Whenever one has a victory, we all have a victory. Amen. Yeah, right. When Dwayne and Charlotte get married on the 15th, aren't we all going to rejoice? Amen. Aren't we all excited for them? Yes. Sure, we rejoice with them over that. You know? It's time to be a part of the team. We are a part of this great team called the church. If jealousy overtakes a worker, then the work stops. If we get jealous because somebody else is getting credit and we didn't get it, the work stops. 
If we're in this for ourselves and we're looking out to make sure everybody knows that we did something, I'm going to tell you, it will hurt the work. The work will stop. It has to be about God. It has to be about the team. It has to be about what God's doing, not about what I'm doing. That's what's important. This work is God's work. It's not our work. It's not my work. It's, I, it's God's work. Amen? Amen? We're merely His to use as He sees fit. And then we all benefit from the work. You know, I was thinking about this. Terry and Anita have taken on responsibility to take care of these beds out here. Take care of some of our landscaping. And it's going to cost them about a day a week. You know, they're going to come up and work on it. They've already started. You've already benefited. Do you know that? You benefited from what they've already done. Right. Amen? You benefited. Veronica does work every week. You benefit from it. A newsletter you get in the mail. You benefit from the work of her doing it and those that come to help put it together. You benefit. Anything that happens around here, if it happens, you benefit from it. Tonight, this meeting we're having, you may not show up. You'll miss out on the apple pie and the ice cream and hot dogs. But you're going to benefit from this meeting. You know why? Because the work of God will continue because of it. There'll be those that will volunteer and those that will take on portions of the work of God and they'll step up and do it. This past week, I, I got to tell you, I was so honored. Um, we have a situation at the Parsonage where we had some damage done. We're trying to collect insurance and uh, we've got a man that's already come out and done all the work and we owe him. And I didn't know how we were going to handle it. And I was, I was losing sleep over what well, I guess I have to just pay him out of my own pocket. And that's not going to be good because I'm not going to have it. And um, so I said, I, I talked to our treasurer and Mary and I decided we need to have a council meeting. You have 24 people on your council. Many of you don't even know this. You have 24 people on your council. They volunteer at the first of the year to take care of the business of the church month by month. It's their responsibility to kind of oversee things. So you don't have to. And uh, they normally meet on the, the they, they meet on a Tuesday night of the month. Well, it's not Tuesday night. So I put a call out. I said, if you could come meet with me, I need your help. A short meeting. The meeting was about 15 minutes long. I just needed some advice. But I needed them to come because they're the only ones I could talk to about it. They're the ones that make that decision. I called them Thursday afternoon and said, could you meet with me tonight? Now, we had some that were out on vacation others gone I can't remember the number I think we had I think we had 19 I think it was either 18 or 19 of the 24 members came three of them drove all the way from Huntsville just for this 15 minute meeting where they just said yes or no I mean basically that was it I walked out of there so honored to me that was such a servant's heart willing to do that to serve in a place of business in the church. Nobody wants those places. Serve on a council. Oh, no, not me. I don't want to do that. But they came and they served. And they took care of some business for you and me. <laughs> and we all benefited from it because of their willingness to serve. Never think what you do doesn't benefit the whole. If you're doing work that God has designed you to do, it will benefit the whole. Just do the job. Don't quit. Just don't quit. Verse 54, quickly. The victor's trophies. I think this is interesting. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And put, and, but he put his armor in his tent. Two trophies David took from the battle. The head of Goliath. And, and, the, and the armor of Goliath. Let's talk about that just for a second. You know, sometimes we need the head of the enemy to remind ourselves that he's been defeated. Sometimes we need to hold that old head that's been chopped off and say, you, you, you don't bother me anymore. I'm done with you. And it's a trophy. Because we've defeated, we've seen God defeat that enemy in our lives. That's a trophy. Sometimes the head of the enemy reminds others 
that he's been defeated. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 57, I thought this was interesting. And David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines. Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. He's carrying his sucker around. Abner says, come on, Saul won't see you. Okay, I'm coming. Can you see him walk in to Saul's presence? Here's the king of Israel standing there, and, and David comes walking in with that head. Saul, you need to understand something. The God we serve is big enough to do whatever he wants to do. Even if it's with somebody as little as me. Look at this. And then it says, he took Goliath's armor into his tent. Now I ask why, because number one, he's not going to be able to use it, right? I mean, if Saul's wouldn't fit him, can you imagine how big Goliath's armor was? It won't be used for battle. It's not fit for that. I believe this was a trophy that, that reminded David of the strength of God. As he looked at that armor, to realize the size of that giant, to realize the armor that would have to be pierced with either a sword or an arrow or something. And yet God took a small stone from David's sling and took him down. You know, it makes me want to ask where my trophies are. Where are your trophies? What trophies do you have? What recent giant have you defeated? Where's your trophy? Your trophy could be a friendship because of some problem you've had with somebody and you finally got it right. Friends restored. There's a trophy. It could be in a changed life. The fact that God changed your life. He took you from something and made you something else. It can be from a saved family. I can look at my children. They're all trophies of God's grace. Remember leading them to Christ. And seeing them come to know Him. What a blessing that is. This ought to be a trophy. A worn Bible. Now if you've got a new one, I understand. But it shouldn't look new very long. Amen. It ought to be written in. The pages, some of them even torn, if you use it. That's a trophy. Let me just close with this. The last text says this, And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? Now that just amazed me. Because Saul already knew David. He talked to him, tried to put his armor on him. But he didn't know whose son he was. David had come and played the instrument in his court. But Saul didn't know who he was. Even Abner couldn't. He said, oh, king, I cannot tell. The king said, inquire thou of whose son this stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I'm the son of the servant of Jesse of Bethlehemite. God can take a nobody that looks like a nobody and do great things. Who cares if Saul knew him? I tell you, we know him, don't we? We know that God used him. And that should be said of our lives. God used me. If there's nothing else we want on our tombstone, it ought to be this. In his life, in her life, God used her. God used you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you this morning for the life of David. May we be a David. May we be that kind of man or woman that has such faith, such commitment, such surrender to your will. That you take us and use us, Father, in ways that others can't even imagine. May we see, Father, the miracles of your grace all around us. Because of our willingness to be completely surrendered to your will. Lord, for that one that's here, or many, that have never really captured that wonderful experience of feeling God use them completely in a situation where they had no control. 
Lord, I pray today because of their commitment today to be used by you that God soon they'll experience that wonder and awe of being a vessel of honor used in the hand of God to accomplish the work of God. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder this morning, are you a David? Are you a David? Do you want to be a David? The battle's ready. The giants stand before us. Yours may be one thing, your other giants for somebody else. We all have giants in our lives. What are you going to do? How are you going to face this giant? You've got to be a David. You've got to stand up to it. You've got to allow God to use you with the armor he's given you to defeat the enemy that stands before you. Or you can stay in your tent. Let's be David's. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. If God speaks to your heart about a decision you need to make, I'll be here at the front. I'll be glad to pray with you. Or if there's a, a need you have, just come. Let us pray over you. Whatever God may be doing in your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As Veronica plays, you do what God's asking you to do right now. <laughs>